All right, and welcome to the show, everybody. This is Theory Underground. I am David McCarricker, and we are joined today by Brian Weeks and Snellgrove and Nance in the chat. Everybody, uh, in can you all hear me? Are we good? You can all unmute yourselves, and I think it'll probably be all right. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Cool. So what we wanted to do today is talk about this book and why we want to read it. We're going to be reading Carl Jaspers' work, The Idea of the University. Starting next Saturday, we'll be having these calls at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, which I believe is like 11 New York time. What time will that be for everybody in the call? It will be 9 o'clock mountain time for me here 8 a.m over here as well be nine for me nine for you okay we're all on the west side it looks like <laughs> cool well why do you all want to take this course or why do we want to have this conversation and uh, maybe introduce yourselves introduce yourself and why you want to do it um, let's go Brian and Nance, me. Alrighty, I guess I'll take it away. Uh, so I'm Brian Weeks. Um, <clears throat> I live in Boise, Idaho, um, and I'm a local high school teacher. Um, I've been working with Dave for a number of years now on various philosophy and theory projects that we've been, uh, and life projects that we've kind of put together. Um, one was maybe a first iteration of Theory Underground, which is called the Victory Farm Center for the Humanities. And we did, um, but we offered philosophy seminars, poetry workshops, and things like that um, over the course of maybe a year and a half span, maybe two, some, somewhere in there. Um, and we have had this sort of ongoing dialogue about um, sort of what the what the proper life of the intellectual scholar might be um that in and why it is that we feel left out even in the university space because we i know we have felt that um in numerous ways over the years um kind of being left out of the university space um even though there's a sense that that should be the perfect space for us um, right i have a master's degree i finished it in the spring of last year um, I did a master's in education. Um, I've had positive experiences at the university. I've gone to two different universities. One was an overall awesome experience at the University of Washington, shout out. Um, and I studied creative writing there. And then I had an over, overall underwhelming experience at the local university here in Boise. Um, you know, and, and so, part of what I want to do with this book is explore why that is, um, what role we might assign to the university, whether or not that's a fair role, what Carl Jaspers thinks that role is, um, and it's sort of foundational um, idea, right? It is the idea of the university, not the goal of the university, but its own idea right. that we're going to be working on. And, and, um, and that's a huge, hugely important question to me. Um, I know we'll be talking about some of those other questions that we're using the structure of the reading of this and we'll get into that later but um for me as someone who um doesn't necessarily want to be a full-on professional intellectual scholar but identifies that as a core component of my life it's like where does where does this all fit and how do i kind of structure this all together where does theory underground fit where does the university still fit in my life and all of these other questions um are hugely important Cool. Cool. So, um, hello, my name is Anne Snellgrove. I also graduated from the same institution that Brian and Dave attended back in the spring of 2021. Um, throughout my time there, I did research with the sociology department about the neoliberalization of higher education, as well as I was able to help develop and teach a course at the university called University Foundations, is college worth it? And so, like I said in my kind of introduction post on the Theory Underground website, I am so 
disappointed that I was not introduced to Jaspers or this reading during that time because the ideas that he presents are exactly what I care about. You know, my, my biggest research focus had always been why is the university not what it what we think it's supposed to be? What um, you know, what has neoliberalization done and what has the corporatization of the university done to kind of change and or like change kind of what the idea the university is supposed to be about and what Jaspers talks about. And so especially my research was focused in how the corporate university that just sends students through to get a career, to get a piece of paper and kind of pass without really thinking, without really caring about their education. I was really interested in that and how all of, you know, what all is going on and the ideas that and thoughts that students themselves have about the university. And so I'm really excited to kind of explore this um, book from my own perspective of like being a student, recently teaching students, and then having Dave and Brian's perspective as well. Um, a little bit more about me is that I am Dave's partner, but I'm also just a lifelong learner. I really care about learning and education and bettering ourselves and like self-actualization. And so I'm really excited to kind of explore that. And yeah. Thank you. Yeah, if you want to do a quick Can you hear intro. me? Yep. Hey, I'm Nance. I'm just the guy from the internet. Um, I've tried to go to college three times and was unsuccessful each time. Um, I had kids early and uh, I had to work and support the family. Um, and it's always been something that I've, I've wanted to to do. Um, I've been lucky enough to work in like direct care with troubled kids um, and not really have to officially get any degrees or anything. Um, but I, I've always been the one guy out like everyone in my life has a master's degree or higher. My partner um, has a master's degree. It just, it's, I've always been felt left out of that. Um, and I, I guess maybe I kind of want to recontextualize my thoughts and feelings about that and just understand why maybe. Yeah. Well, and that's fantastic. And uh, one of the things that I think we'll all get from this is the ability to sort of measure the university experiences that we've had positive and negative against the ideal of the university. So the, one of the questions as we go forward is when things are going, when we had a good experience, is that kind of what Jaspers is talking about? Or was it something that fell outside of what he had in mind? And when we had a bad experience, is that something that he was also keen on that he predicted or that he already saw in the university of his day or not, you know? And so one of the things as three alumni from Boise State, though, that I wanted to do, actually, since this is a public event, this we are speaking here to the public, we're essentially saying not only are we doing this course, but we think that if you care about higher learning, education, college, university, whether you're trying to decide whether to go or not to go or trying to make sense of the experiences that you had there, good and bad, this is something that you should take seriously and consider taking with us. Um, we're going to have probably five or six people in the group, unless a few more people join this week, because this begins on sa uh, Saturday morning. That'll be Saturday the 14th. Um, but going back to the idea that this is public, this, uh, this stream, it's just going to be out there on the internet. Um, I wanted to dedicate to dedicate this stream to not just Boise State, but specifically President Marlene Trump. Because she's new to Boise State, she's, she's filling in for somebody else who was there for a long time, who I knew personally. Um, I haven't met her yet. I hope to someday. And I think that anybody who is coming 
to higher education from a basis in philosophy um, and thinking about what it means to be in the humanities or social sciences in a, in a, at a time when everything is all about STEM and what kind of job you're going to get and, and it's more about the, the grades and the earnings you'll make later on. Um, we have a sort of responsibility, not just to critique, um, but this is a positive critique. Well, what, it's worth thinking about what is the thing that we want. What is the idea that structures or uh, originate, you know, in, in, uh, uh, conceived the institution itself? And so um, I actually hope that this will be something that a lot of university administrators tune in for over the years to come. I, I suspect it'll probably be you know, organic growth takes a while for things to get around. But um, one of the things with my channel is a lot of times I'll find out that a person who I least suspected to watch stuff here ended up actually watching something here. And so the question then for administrators at the public university today, one of the questions is why are students who care about philosophy and theory, which is to say, trying to understand truth and how everything fits together, really, to keep it very, very bare bones. That's what it's all about. Why are they falling through the, tr through the cracks at the university when we're not challenge averse? We're not challenge averse types of people. Um, so I'll just say, uh, before handing it back over to you all, and you can talk about some of the, your frustrations, um, my frustrations did not come from the fact that it was too hard. It came from the fact that in a lot of cases, it was hard in the wrong ways. It was hard in a way that kept me from pursuing my interests, my research questions, and actually got in the way of a more rigorous dialogue with other truth seekers from various disciplines. Because at the end of the day, as what we'll, we'll be learning from Carl Jaspers, Part of the idea of the university, if it is to be something more than just an intellectual department store, is that these are all, every department, every field, every discipline is a piece of the human experience of the world. And the role of philosophy is to try to understand how they fit together. And the role of any researcher and teacher in any one of these fields or disciplines is to be in dialogue with the whole, with the vision of the universe not just the universe in the sense of the universe out there, but specifically the universal, universal truths. And if there's a specific field that has its own approach to truth seeking, it has to at least try to understand how it is similar or differs from or with or to these other fields. And so that dialogue was one of the things that was lacking and that I'm going to be pursuing here for the rest of my life. And so, um, yeah, does anybody want to say anything about positive, negative kinds of things? I, I think right now, let's just, let's save some of the more positive things because let's get into the positive stuff later. Let's just, let's just do a grievance session here. Let's talk about a few of the things that got in the way of learning. Uh, I have yeah, oh, go ahead, Brian. Andy, you want to go first? I guess we both. You can go first, Brian. Um, I don't, yeah, I think you're right to say that uh, this would be a fantastic book or I hope course uh, for university administrators uh, down the road or even community college administrators. Um, I hadn't even really thought about the distinction there yet. I think that'd be an interesting conversation. Um, Wait, I don't which really, distinction? Huh? Uh, like a community college, a two-year college first like four-year. Um, yeah, Spurs does not get into that. Um, I don't yeah. uh, specifically want to put Dr. Trump on blast necessarily because I think I said, so context here, um, I finished the master's program in the spring, but graduation, the way universities work, slow sort of bureaucratic machines, I didn't get to actually go to a graduation ceremony until about two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe. Um, and at that sort of ceremony, um, 
I was also in the middle of thinking through this course where we're going, um, you know, and the main message of um, president of the university their, their her message was basically you're worth more money now that you have a degree, mostly speaking to undergraduates, right? Cause that's the majority of people graduating. Um, you are now worth more money and with almost like a wink, you're better than everyone else now. And like, you know, I said to my wife afterwards, I was like, she probably wouldn't get that job if she didn't fundamentally believe certain things. And there's a whole section on the difference between a, a university administrator and a professor and what their roles are. And, and I think that is gonna be a very useful distinction for us to weed through um, because her role is different, right? Um, she has a lot to do and she, she, she's a manager and not a teacher, right? Um, and and that, that matters, but it got me to thinking and, and I started looking and I think this is just like, this is the case and why I think I had a overall decent experience at one university and the other one basically experienced Echo Dave's where I just, I felt, you know, like, and, and I really don't mean this as a brag, I had a 4.0 in grad school and I thought everyone did. It was the easy, I felt like I just kind of walked through it and they're like, we want you to have this degree so you can get a raise at work because I'm a teacher and teachers get raises when they get master's degrees. Right. You know, and, <clears throat> and that felt like sort of the message um, but when I look, and I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this about Boise State's grad programs, there is not a PhD in the humanities. None? Have you ever noticed that? In any? So I've, I've really been looking, and it would appear, I don't know the internal politics, the master's in English is in disarray, and they're not currently accepting new students. The master's in communication, which you did, doesn't exist anymore. I didn't do a master's in communication. Or you were connected to it in some way, right? To that communication department my, where they did uh, a lot of critical theory courses and stuff, I believe. It was um, most, most of my critical theory people were in other departments, not communication okay. actually. But fair, you know, I did an interdisciplinary degree under Dr. Right. Malumbi, yeah. But. And so I think that sort of the conversation to connect this all to Jaspers and where we're going to be going is – he was really worried about the dominant role that the natural sciences had started to play in the university a hundred years ago in Germany, right? And we're seeing that continue and that problem continue and it helps us to think through. Um, for me, he softens my gut response, which is screw the sciences, screw STEM. That's my gut, right? That's my natural bias against them. He softens that and, and shows their role and their place. And I think that's fantastic that he can hold that in suspense, but also he's like, if that's all you're doing, we've got big problems here because the human element and the interpretive element and the critical rational element is non-existent when you don't really invest in the humanities and in philosophy. And so I don't think everyone needs to go to graduate school. I don't think that's an essential thing for the vast majority of people. Um, but I do think it reflects on a university, what they're investing their money into and what they're really training people in and bringing people through the most. And, and I think the case is for a lot of universities, sciences rule business, um, business programs bring in a shitload of money. And so they tend to, you know, get a lot of favoritism. Boise State's no different education programs like I went to. Um, because we have to get further training as teachers. It's part of the law. Those programs bring in a lot of money and tuition dollars. So they get a lot of privilege at the expense sometimes of, uh, especially like a small local college in an underpopulated state, right? I mean, that's what Boise State is fundamentally. Um, we're not a sort of coastal intellectual city that wants to have this big university. That's not the mission of locals here. So, um, right we run into all of these challenges and, and I think to really return and then I'll shut up is university presidents really thinking through their role in all of this would be um, really cool. I almost want to have a copy of this book just on me at all times. Cause I live near campus and I walk through all the time. If I just run into, it, I'm like, Hey, you don't have to read this, but I'm making sure you own it. You know, Absolutely. that would be great. That would be Absolutely. Great. 
And before yeah. we hand it over to Anne, because I know you had some stuff to add, I wanted to read a couple of comments in the chat. Um, but the other thing I was going to say really quick, I had forgotten to, was um, the reason I'm dedicating this to Marlene Trump, I just felt like it's particular, but it still relates to the universal because the struggles that she's dealing with the audiences that she needs to appeal to if they are to get funding. Um, it's something that every administrator in this country is dealing with. And at the time that Jaspers wrote this, who did he have in mind? He dedicated the book. I'll read the beginning here. He says, to Carl Heinrich Bauer, professor of surgery, president of Heidelberg University, and in charge of its reconstruction in friendship and gratitude. And so... This is why it's a positive critique because Jaspers is not just interested in trying to get people not go to school or not go to college. No, he is saying we need to reconstruct the university after Nazism. And what do we need to be worried about? Science, capitalism slash business, and politics, totalitarianism and politics. Um, these are the, It's not that all of these things are the enemies of philosophy or of understanding or of truth-seeking but they have different interests, right? And so there, there's a contradiction in interests, and if we're not cognizant of what those contradictions are, how can we, how can we work with that, right? Okay. Take it away, Anne. Oh, are you going to read from the chat? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> um, Shapiro's dead cat in, my, in the chat says, university was complicated for me. For one, I was the first person in my college to graduate with a degree in philosophy. For another, though, I was dissuaded from going to higher learning by my French professor, like from going into a PhD route. It sucked because I felt kind of determined. However, I thought my French professor had a point. I did kind of suck at university, just to be clear. <laughs> my professor has said that, like, administration is the problem. Um... And then Master Signified Bodies just joined the chat. What's up, Andrew? Good to see you. He said, nice. Excited this is happening. He's someone who, being in the, in the Navy for the last, what, seven years? Something like that. Uh, is definitely interested in a professional career to come. Um, and has, I believe, taken some university courses through the Navy while, while doing this stuff. Is that right, Andrew? But, yeah, you're, uh, he's... I think in the club of people who is not sure what exactly his relationship to these institutions is, right? We're all kind of in that boat where it's like, we like you, but you don't like us. <laughs> we don't really feel like, well, like our interests are going to be included here. And we'll get more into it later, but one of the big things that Jaspers talks about is like, what kinds of people does the university need to be recruiting? Obviously, it needs to recruit students in general, not just the best. It can't always just recruit the best. At the end of the day, it also has to prepare people for careers, and some people are just going to care about jobs. But the university will perish if the people who are doing it for its own sake are not being recruited and are being alienated, are being filtered out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's like a good segue into kind of my experience, especially teaching the class the, in the last spring semester. One of the, the biggest complaints of students is, oh my gosh, they do not want to have to take anything that is not directly related to the career that they are going into or to the major that they are in. These students, they hate with a capital H reading and writing, which is like, those are so fundamental to learning and working things out is reading and writing and so because of that professors know that their students aren't going to read and so they don't they're not even assigning readings they give you like 10 pages of a newspaper article or something from like some kind of reputable source like i was so excited to take a sociology like take, take sociology classes and even some philosophy classes and throughout my entire time in sociology i was not one time assigned to read a full primary text. I didn't even read any primary text at all in sociology classes. And in the two philosophy classes I took, it was like tiny little sections of philosophy that I had no context for, I wanted more, but just didn't have the time to get into because, oh, 
we're done with that. It's on to the next one now. Like the only classes where I was actually being required to read just a couple of books were my favorite classes my whole time there. And every other student thought it was the hardest class they've ever had to take because all they had to do was read and write essays um, and get critiqued on those essays. And so I don't blame any individual student for that being their mindset going into the university because you know re like the research that the intermountain social research lab is doing just shows that these students are they're so afraid of the future and what it holds for them financially excuse me <coughs> um that they just think that they need to be there to get a good job to get the degree to be able to pay for their lives and their families um sorry yeah and you're saying fair enough right <laughs> and so fair enough, but I think it's just so important for us to return to texts like this and kind of remember why are we here and why, like what makes our lives meaningful. And so I was, I was telling Dave last night, I said, oh, reading this book just makes me sad because the mindset that Jaspers talks about is like, man, you know, is on this fundamental search for, for truth and knowledge and wants to become whole and, you know, like understanding the unity of all these facets of knowledge. I'm like, where, like, where does that exist within the university right now? I see it within individuals like the four of us and the people in this chat, and there's lots of people, but it's, it's definitely not the pervasive kind of mindset in the university right now. And so I think similar to, you know, Brian and Dave, I felt let down at the end of the day through my time in like, a sociology department. I had really good experiences as well that we can maybe talk about. But at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, okay, I read five books total in three years. That's not very good. Um, yeah, so I'm just excited to like explore and look at the contrast of what Yaskers is talking about versus what we see now and why why that divide, like why where that divide is coming from and maybe what needs to change culturally and socially to inspire students to like remember that, oh yeah, learning is actually cool and, and knowing things and being like a well-rounded individual with skills in the humanities and in the sciences is really just, it's important in its own sake and just for like understanding the world and being a member of humanity. Excellent, yeah, thank you. So one of the things I wanted to talk about before we get off the grievance, session here, you know, um, is because we'll get into the positive things and then we'll talk about the kind of guiding questions we have approaching this text. But I wanted to say, uh, busy work and, and, and all of these, you know, um, sort of arbitrary deadlines that fill your week, the, reason that Carl Jaspers is against it is because the root of school is skole. I'm not sure if I'm saying the Greek correctly or not, but the point is skole means leisure, okay? In time energy theory, right? The point is not to just have time. You want to have energy infused time and not just you know, pieces of it, random and willy-nilly. It needs to be reliable, repeatable, and going off of a popular sort of self-help and business success author's terminology. Um, what's the name of the author of Deep Work and Digital Minimalism? Cal, Cal Newport. Cal Newport, in his work, Deep Work, he's writing a sort of intervention in the business world, especially the programming world of like, you know, Silicon Valley, Google, you know, et cetera. And his point is like, you know, they've, they've torn down the walls, they've put everything on wheels, they've put everybody in the same area, it's chitter chatter, chitter chatter, chitter, chitter chatter. And the idea is that that will increase productivity and communication and connections and everyone will be more creative as a result and more cooperative as a result. Okay, the problem with tearing down all these barriers, um, solitude and solicitude, genuine being with others and genuine being with oneself, these two things are interdependent upon one another, right? To really have quality time with other people, you also have to have quality time with yourself. 
And quality time is not just, oh, you got away for a second. No, it's big chunks of time. And for him, he's talking about deep work. He's talking about solving big problems or really getting an intimate understanding of a field or of a workplace that requires unstructured time and lots of it. And it has to be repeatable because if you just have one big block of time every week, well, that's not enough. You got to have days of that in a row. Okay. And that was how it was for uh, a very privileged and select few usually children of aristocrats or the especially bright children of the working class who were going to get to join the priest class uh, in the medieval university kind of scene. Uh, I'm saying kind of scene because it's not really... Uh, it, it, the, the comparisons between then and now are going to be hard to make, right? There's so many differences. But th those differences are some of the things that we'll be getting into as we get into this text. Uh, the main thing I want to say, though, is that Small classes with a lot of time with a professor or a mentor to actually read through primary texts and then sit there and go, what does this mean? And actually work through that. That is a time-honored tradition. And if you are, and if for a good reason, if you are the child of someone who is extremely wealthy you're not going to be going to Boise State and sitting in a classroom of 25 to 150 students listening to a lecture that's 45 minutes long before you go run out the door and then have 20 minutes before the next class, okay? The, there's nowhere quiet on campus that you can reliably go to study. There's nowhere quiet where you can focus. And there's, I would like to go around and actually survey all the students, but I think that it would be very rare to find a full-time student who actually has three consecutive hours that they actually could turn off their phone and focus on a text. The, the, the whole way that everything works with uh, enrollment and scheduling currently makes it very hard to find three to six hour blocks of time where you could focus. And it does take three to six hours to even get traction and really get going in a text, especially with as we become more and more distracted especially as we get more and more out of the habit of reading, especially as students entering the university are increasingly functionally illiterate. Okay. And then and you also consider the fact that a lot of, because of the cost of the university, most students have to work part-time, if not full-time. And then that is also cutting into their ability to just focus and have three to six hour chunks of time for studying and, and reading and writing. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, do either of you want to speak to the functional literacy point at all? I know that, Anne, you, with your course that you were teaching, you had problems with what, when it came to assigning readings. I mean, I can I mean, speak to that on two levels. Um, one is, when I got out of high school, like my family is not a college bound family. I'm the only one to earn a bachelor's degree in my family. I mean, you can go through all my cousins and everything. Like, and and I, I got out of high school functionally illiterate, right? Like I'm, that had already started by the time our generation was emerging from high school, what, 15 years ago, maybe before I couldn't say, but um, what I mean by that is like, I could, in sort of the English teacher language, I could decode a text, meaning I could take my eyes across the page and read all of the words from top to bottom. I could not comprehend 60% of that most of the time, unless it was a pretty easy text. And um, I didn't know that was the case. I, you know, I, I would say I was pretty average, um, but I wasn't prepared. Like I, as, a current English teacher at like an alternative high school, which is what I went to, um, which is sort of the school for students that are academically struggling, emotionally struggling, um, dysfunctional homes, this kind of thing is pretty common. Um, I, I graduated high school. I don't remember reading a book cover to cover in high school um, or junior high. Now it might've happened and I forgot, but that's also telling. 
right? Um, and so I can also see the same kind of on the inside of the system, someone who graduates seniors and like to a certain degree has to give a stamp of approval. This person's theoretically functionally ready for college if they were to choose to go. Now, I don't impress upon my students that they must go to college in order to have a satisfactory life. But like theoretically, if you've left my class, you're ready for an English class at college. That's kind of the idea. Um, and I almost sometimes in my head have to go, well, I know what colleges expect now. It's right. The bar is pretty low because um, it's had to be. And uh, the, the causes, the reasons for this are multifaceted. It's something I want to, for us to explore as we read what that relationship between the university and the school is for Jaspers. Um, we might not get too much into critique of his position. I think I have my own. Um, but I at least want us to be very clear in distinguishing what that is, um, because what I think we're fundamentally seeing is that the university um, is just a school. And because it's become a school, um, it's taken the load off of primary schooling to, to a certain extent. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, because everything's just been instrumentalized really all our metrics are do you have a satisfactory ability to get and hold a job that's our metric as a sort of high school staff now as a college staff that's going to be the kind of are you prepared to hold a job and with my students i can absolutely if that is the metric i can say yeah because i've before i ever went into teaching i just worked i worked warehouse jobs. I worked desk jobs. I had some administrative roles for companies. Um, I just worked in the private sector. And what I can tell you is most people can't write an email and they don't need to know how to write an email. That's a, you know, like yeah, written communication isn't as essential in the everyday business world as people say, unless you're a manager and most people aren't going to be managers. Right. And, um, and so because everything's instrumentalized, we, and we've kind of taken truth out of the equation, I think is the language we're going to have to adopt from Jaspers. We've taken that truth or the um, sort of existential reason why we would take an English class, a philosophy class, a history class, a sociology class, a science class even, um, our existential desire to know has been removed from the equation. We, we can lower the bar. Mm. So there's no reason to have a high one, I think. A real life example of that happening at Boise State right now is um, the research program or cohort that I was a part of with the sociology department called the Intermountain Social Research Lab. And that was like by far my best experience at the university. I actually got to pursue like rigorous research that I wanted, that I was interested in. I was reading a whole bunch of books and being able to like work alongside with these very knowledgeable and well-read professors. And it was really just focused on like the theory and the literature review and then and turning that into an interview instrument and talking face to face with students and then analyzing that data. And so like that, you know, Jaspers talks about research being one of the like important aspects of a university or the idea of the university. And like there I had what I consider to be really good research um, opportunity. Well, the chair of the sociology department um, has stepped down or is on sabbatical and a new chair has stepped up and we were talking about this research lab and she said yeah I think I'm going to change it up and just make try to make everything a bit more applicable and have them going out and doing you know like real life real life application of this and I thought no this is the only good thing that happens to me at the university and you're going to instrumentalize it because that's what students want and that's what the professors think they need to teach is application application how are you going to apply this in the real world not just oh doing research and reading and, and analyzing data for its own sake and so yeah like kind of what you were talking about it's like it's 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 literally happening right now in, in our university at our alma mater i wanted before because i'm sure dave has something to add in i do want to speculate and this is just a theory i have working even though everything's been instrumentalized and that is you've heard it i've heard it 
the critique from students, how does this apply to my real life, right? I mean, I think that's a learned behavior and they don't buy their own BS. Because, and what I've started doing at the beginning of every quarter in my own courses with like, you know, what is it, 14 to 18 year old kids, I say, this class has no value to your future in, as an employee. Like I'll, like I have a, like a presentation I do, I say this, you know, and I will kind of walk them through why I'm saying what I'm saying. This class is not about that. So if you're gonna, if the, the slideshow is called a few thoughts on the question, why, right? And I make, because it's, why do I have to do this? How is this gonna help me in the future? And I tell them it's not, or if it does, it's an accident, you could, then you're welcome you know, that kind of thing. Because it will, I mean, the things you learn in an English class are valuable in, as instruments in your life. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I let them know there are other classes we'll offer you that are totally valuable. We do a careers class because our students just don't know how to navigate that world and that will affect them financially in the future and they need that. But I, and I, and I say, that's what that class is for. My class is a little bit different. You deserve to have both experiences, you know? Um, but that's not something that is common. I'm sure if my colleagues walked in during that lecture, they'd be like, what in the hell are you doing? You're telling them that the only reason to read this book is because they might get something of personal value from it. And maybe they won't. And they're just going to have to accept that they don't like a book sometimes. Right. But mm -hmm. I think we do need more of that. Um, and when I say it to students, the reason I don't think they even believe it when they're asking you, you know, what good is this going to do my life? As soon as I say that, I never hear that question again. Good. Yeah. I get a lot less pushback because they go, oh, this guy actually gets what I really want from this class. But I've been told that this is the question I have to ask to get that other thing. Right. And that's one of those things that I think is often lost on administration, especially when they're taking these demands seriously. They hear these demands from the parents and all this pressure coming from the parents. Oh, my kid can't get a job now and I spent all this money getting them through college. What the heck? But then the kids echo those demands and it makes you think, okay, everyone's over learning in, the, in this higher sense. That's just idealism. Let's get to the real. What actually matters and is pragmatic. And uh, look, I've no professor that actually made me say, I don't regret being there. I don't regret having taken those, you know, going to the university. No professor who made me say it's worth it gave up on that idea. They and and none of them believe that we just want jobs because the what makes a good educator a good educator in part, obviously there's a lot of parts to this, but one of the essential threads I do believe is that they see you as more than just how you are. They see in you or they have faith that in you is a spark of potential that can be a kindled and brought to life and that you can care about things outside of money and survival, that you can care about things outside of the day-to-day -day grind that humans have always had to care about. Okay. And with that, you did say, you said there was something that surely I was going to add into this. Yes. I have it up on the screen. Don't worry about it. People in the chat, you won't be able to see it. Uh, but it is, the face of a man, the president of Howard University, he is on MSNBC in dialogue with Dr. Cornell West. Cornell West was brought on MSNBC to talk about an article he had written in defense of the Western canon. He is a sensible kind of person who sees that there's good and bad, but that at the end of the day, you need that education to have a basic literacy um, and understanding of what it means to be human in this world and that he is for expanding the canon, not for throwing it out, right? So if, if it's overrepresented by white people or whatever, he's like, no, expand it. Don't, don't throw out um, Dante and, you know, don't, don't throw out Plato. No, everyone, I'm sorry, you're not going to have, you'd have a PhD, a professor in philosophy, but you've never read Plato. Shh, come on, these people invented the university and they were a lot better at it than us in many ways. There's things we can learn from them. Um, and so there he says all those things, but to, to make it spicy, MSNBC also brought on the president of Howard University and uh, 
I'm hoping that if I push play, it'll be the correct clip and that you'll all be able to hear. So nod your heads if you hear when it starts to play. Uh, with a presidential commission on academic renewal, I wasn't a part of that, my predecessor was, and was to look at how we look at our academic offerings, the quality of them, um, looking at the numbers of students involved, and looking in ways that we can contemporize um, these offerings. So the first thing I would say is I think the headline um, probably misrepresented what is happening at Howard. While we are closing the classics department, we are not stopping offering classics. We do believe that the classics are important as a foundational study, just as important as we believe African-American studies is uh, to the black student today. And then the last thing I would say is we also are focused on contemporizing uh, the experience um, of the black student so that they can take the classics and apply it to today's world. You have to remember, we can teach them about Pluto and Seneca and so on, but the reality is these students have to go out in a world and live in a world where they see a George Floyd murdered, and they have to be able to transfer um, that skill set. And so what I think we've been doing here at Howard and, and doing successfully is not asking students so much about their major, but asking them more about their mission and trying to give them a contemporary education that has foundational elements, but also has progressive um, elements to it as well. Now, I don't want to play the entirety of the clip. I want to share the link to that in the chat or, or in the in the comments below this video, and people will be able to watch the rest of it later. Um, it's a good back and forth, but at the end of the day, the, the, when you have a, a the burden of abolishing the classics department and contemporizing the university to help the individual consumer make this education about their mission, um, you're gonna, there's going to be good and there's going to be bad with that. And he's right that people are going out into a world today that's different than the world that they were going out into before. The students going into this university are different than the students from 50 to 100 years ago going to Howard. Okay. But in the context of this conversation, he talks about contemporizing a bit more. He's talking about needing to accelerate getting them out on the street so they can go do activism. The problem with this, and we'll get more into instrumentalization as we go, is that the, the idea of leisure not just leisure where you're at the beach hanging out. No, that's not leisure. That's free time. You're, you're hanging out. No, leisure that's productive, energy infused. You can put effort towards things that you find interesting or worthwhile in themselves. That runs completely counter to this idea of getting people equipped as fast as possible and then out the door, right? Yeah, people have to survive. People have to uh, go back to their communities. People have to be involved but this idea that an activist is better off getting out there sooner. No, I'm sorry. Yes, we need to change the world. But how are we going to change the world if the people who are supposed to be changing the world haven't ever actually been able to have the freedom of engaging with other truth seekers for its own sake, without it being immediately bent back into, how is this being applied? How is this being applied? How is this being applied? How is, I'm sorry. Stop asking students what their mission is when they're 20, 21, 22, 35. Stop asking them what their mission is and ask them, can you understand this text? The, what a person thinks their mission is a lot of the time is something that they think is supposed to be their mission. But like what they actually think is their mission and like what their actual mission is, there might be a big disparity there. And if they don't have the time and freedom to actually engage with other truth seekers around primary texts, uh, I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't think that the real change is going to come from anyone who's being rushed through the system in that way. Uh, at least people like us felt like we were not really getting that opportunity in the way that we should have. In the same way that Brian was talking about in his master's program, he was like, well, this is like the easiest level to this. This should have been the hardest. Um, yeah, the graduate level, 
stuff happening at at least my state, our state university, not only was it like easier, but it's also like it to me, it just felt like an opportunity for a bunch of people who have imposter syndrome to fake it till they make it, not because they actually get the hang of and master the skills that the masters they are pursuing represents. But no, it's instead about um, having something to say about the text that was assigned. And that's it. And that's what the gutting idea, that's where the gutting idea comes in. And for those who do not know, in graduate school, gutting is a, one of the most normal practices ever. You're given a stack of books like this high, and you're told, okay, read those before class next week. And because it's too many and you don't have any time, you have to gut those texts, which means you read the table of contents, you read the first page, the last page, you go through looking for italics, you do a few underlinings, you take a few notes, you read a couple, uh, you know, spark notes, web pages, or maybe you read a blog post, or you read a Goodreads review, and now you've formulated your own take on the thing, and now you have something to add. And by the way, a lot of them even then still don't have anything to add. <laughs> Because, because everyone kind of knows that they're, they're BSing their way through it. Okay, I said everyone. I'm exaggerating a little bit. And uh, I think that's almost, almost, almost time to be done with the grievance session. Anyone have anything else to add to that before we switch gears into some positives and then our questions about the text? No? Yeah? I'm uh, nodding, shaking. Look, I was, uh, I think I'm going to save what I'm thinking about for the future because okay. it goes in a new direction um, and could lead us down a 45 minute rabbit hole. So um, I'm just, yeah, it will come up later because it comes up every time we talk about this stuff. So it's okay. If Shapiro's dead me. cat in the chat just said, wait, what's the text? It's called The Idea of the University, and it's by Carl Jaspers. Brian's holding it up to the camera right now for anyone who doesn't have eyes on screen. And folks, I recorded every chapter of this read aloud by yours truly um, and released it as like a advent uh, leading up to Christmas. I had It was like every day there was a new chapter of the book that I released to this channel and I'm about to release all of the chapters in one audio file on the podcast and uh, and then I'll take down I don't know if I'm gonna take down the individual chapters or not but the point is is like they're 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 very Christmas themed and they're very specific to the moment what I want is that you could click onto the audiobook and listen to it all the way through and so that'll be on this channel I'll slightly rebrand it so it's not Christmas themed anymore uh, but that's being made available because people are busy, people are driving. Carl Jaspers is understandable. He's a very clear reader or, or, or author. And so what I'm hoping is that a lot of the professors who are very busy, the ones that we might want to share this with in the future, uh, or administrators, will be able to listen to this in bits and pieces over time and struggle with it, think about it, wrestle with these big ideas uh, because without big ideas, what are we? Workers. Yeah, Consumers. and I'm going to say it brief because I, I, I probably shouldn't have said a thing and then not said anything. Um, just to brief, the thing I'm thinking is I don't want people to go away from this video thinking, oh, we're just a bunch of people who kind of have a, a desire to be punished by our professors. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and we're holding everyone to this high standard that they don't need to be held to. I think no. in a way, yes, not everyone needs to be held to that standard, but also the university isn't serving those people with the standard that we have. Two, I want to say, I think the reason we have the standard we have is this, not because we want to read the most number of pages. Yes, sometimes Dave and I might go into, I read so many pages this month or whatever at a personal level, but that actually doesn't matter. Okay, I think what we're talking about is serious thinking. And, and there are different modes of thinking. You think differently reading, you think differently writing, and you think differently in conversation with others. That's why we structure what we do the way we do. 
because of those three things. And when we're asked to read either so much we never could in a certain amount of time or so little that it's insignificant, what we're basic the critique is we're not being asked to think by professors or by universities. When we have classes in which we're told how to read the text rather than talking about what's going on in there and struggling through them, we're not thinking about the text, right? When the writing assignments are brief or we don't get feedback on the writing assignments that's sufficient, we're not really being asked to think in our writing but to perform a task and everything then starts to feel very performative. And I think that's really the fundamental sort of critique we're getting at. It's not that it's just too easy. It's that it's like you said, the wrong kind of hard. Yeah. Um, I want to be, I, I want to be challenged to think really hard in new thoughts because new thoughts don't come easy. They just don't. It's don't. new terrain and to get to new terrain is difficult. And I want to be led into that new terrain. And sometimes you don't need to read a lot to get there. Sometimes you really do. Um, and a good professor or a good program would know how to structure that experience so that you get the most out of it, the most mileage, I guess. Yeah, we're not saying we've mastered it ourselves. We've been experimenting with reading, writing, thinking, or talking. Reading, writing, talking as three modes of thinking. We've been experimenting with that for years, and you know, we're far from being where we want to be with that. And this is the first course that Theory Underground is offering, and we'll get a lot better as time goes on, we hope. But uh, the thing I wanted to say about the reading, writing, thinking, sorry, reading, writing, talking as the three aspects or ways of, of conversation. Thinking. Conversation. Instead of talking, are you saying talking is like more superficial than conversation? Conversation, I think, yeah, at least to me as more implied back and forth between interlocutors. Okay. I can talk to myself. Right. Reading, writing, conversation goes in that order. And if people are not being challenged to do serious reading or writing and they're not being expected to, and the structure of everything makes it so they can't, guess what? The conversation doesn't ever really go anywhere. And so you can participate in the conversation, but the difference between a conversation be between people who did do the reading and people who are kind of faking it like they did the reading, it's significant and it's one that is visceral and there's nothing more depressing than being like wow i'm so pulled in in all these different directions by all these big ideas and texts and concepts that i'm wrestling with and trying to understand yet here i am hanging out with a bunch of people who are just kind of faking their way through this just to make the professor happy just so we can get the grade and get out the door Okay, that's, that's depressing. And that's why we do this kind of stuff is because after having our souls crushed, <laughs> this is like rehab. And uh, the last bit's a bit about rereading. Uh, we keep saying primary texts. Uh, Shapiro's Dead Cat in chat said primary texts was one of their favorite things as well. Yeah, all of us are fans of that because if you actually read a primary text, you're reading an OG work. You're reading one of the originals. And... What, even if they talked in a different way and even if it's been translated by other people um, into English, their voice comes through. And this is the, – the dialogue between truth seekers is not just between students and professors in the university alive today. It's the real point is the dead thinkers. Who are the ones – that others for hundreds of years have sacrificed their lives to teach and uphold and say, no, these people need, these, this is important. You know, you'll, you'll have any person who's in the canon is still there because of a, a battle that's been going on for millennia. And the battle is over who's worth being remembered and who's not. And one of the deciding factors is after you read them, when you come back and you reread them, do you get more when you come back and reread them? Or do you get, or, or do you, okay, this is worthless. If you get more every time you come back, it's rich, okay? And if the conversations get richer every time people are coming back to it, that's an indicator that there's something there. And if people sacrifice their lives to read and teach that thinker, 
That's another one of those indicators that it's worthwhile. And when you give people summaries or expect people just to go get summaries or, either, or they're just reading fragments the whole time they're in school, then they've never actually sat with one of the greatest minds of history. Imagine getting through a university program and now you've got a degree and now you're in the workplace and then you tune into this and you find out the most valuable thing about that whole experience is the thing you missed out on. Actually getting to commune with great minds, the greatest in the history of humanity as it's been recorded. Obviously there's problems with how it's been recorded, but you know, we can't even go there if we don't if we're not a part of that dialogue. All right, but that's enough negative stuff. The university is also some of the greatest things that's ever happened to all of us, right? If it wasn't, one of the things that Jasper says uh, is that really the, 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 the highest earning students, the hardest working students, the ones who are there for the right reasons, we are, I say we, you know how I stuck myself in there, but we want a big final project and then we want to have our coursework that leads us to that big pr final project and not all this other quizzes, not all these other little things that are going to get in the way of working towards that final project. And I think a big part of the reason is having unstructured time, having a lot of it so that we are able to figure things out on our own. Um, now I'm drawing a blank. Where was I going with this? Help me out, people. Got distracted by chat. You are segueing to what's good. Oh, yeah. I disagree with Jaspers on this. Um, well, I agree with... I, okay, once, once the spark inside of you has been kindled and cultivated and now you're on fire and you care about this stuff and you're there for all the right reasons, I guess technically he's still correct. But when, when you're dealing with people who are coming into your classroom and they've never really read a primary text or had a real conversation, much less written about this stuff in a rigorous way, uh, you've got to find a way to break them of that. And if you just have a big final project... And th by the time they get to it, they're just going to fail and get spat right back out into the work machine. And so I want to say shout out to Dr. Cates at North Idaho College for giving me an F on my first quiz. Okay. If you had not given me an F on my first week quiz, which was a writing reflection, how can you fail a writing reflection? Right. He was able to tell that I had not done the reading that I had basically just done a Sparks Notes because I was really busy. I had a lot of math and science homework. And so I was like, oh, okay, Plato's Republic. Uh, read a quick summary, wrote a couple things. F, okay? He said, you didn't cite anything from the text. There's no reason that I'm, you're not doing any interpretation or exegesis. You need to be doing those things. I'm like, exegesis, what? Exegesis, right? Unpack what's being said there in your own words. And so, um, that getting kind of smacked upside the head first semester as a freshman really woke me up and made me go, okay, I can't just do summaries. I need to take the humanities classes more seriously. And then because it forced me to do the hardest thing in the world, which is actually read page after page after page of something that doesn't feel natural at all because it's seemingly so far removed from our world today and then relating that into the current day. Like because I was forced to do it, it actually made it work. It, it opened this stuff up to me and, and, it, and it ignited a passion. And so I just want to say thank you to professors who do use some form of busy work if what you're trying to do is find the people who just aren't doing the things that they need to be doing if they're going to get anything out of it at all. Because the whole, the whole hippie flip the classroom approach that kind of throws out the door that any kind of grading up front um, – yeah, that's good if the students are already there for the right reasons. But if they're not, no, something else is going to be required. And so there's a lot of great professors. Anyone want to say anything nice about the university before we get into the questions about the text? I want to echo a couple things you just said, uh, the value of um, holding students accountable um, at, a, at a higher level, I think, is a really good thing. Um, so, and so... I, so I went to the University of Washington for my undergrad and had an overall really great experience that, I mean, it's a massive school, it's a state school, it definitely still has 
departments that are very much instrumental and they do all these things that we've kind of spent some time critiquing, but I never felt out of place there either, which I thought was really great. On top of that, so I went there after having like flunked out of Boise State and then went to a community college and kind of learned how to be a student for the first time. And I went, got to the University of Washington and I was like, I'm going to be an English major and I'm going to be a creative writing major. Like, and the way the school set it up was they set barriers to entry. They were totally accessible, but they let you know that you had to be serious. Um, so you had to pass a, uh, a couple courses to get into the English major and apply to be an English major. And then once you were an English major, you then had to take two creative writing courses, get recommended by those instructors and then apply to be a creative writing major mm. totally accessible to any student who really wants to do it but it communicates this is more than just getting the degree at the end of the pipeline and they scared the shit out of me similarly i mean it you know it was partly i wasn't a good student yet i came out of high school illiterate and i think i came out of college still only barely literate because i had just had to scrape my way through right but very first paper in that like you have to pass this class to get in the English major class we're on a four point scale nothing was graded on a hundred point scale and I got a 1.9 on this first paper it was like a huge deal and I was crushed I was like I'm never gonna be an English major this is never gonna happen I'm not in like I can't write a paper I've been told by all these professors before this oh you're constantly doing well you're getting all these good grades you know and they're like yeah I mean you got the grade you earned on that paper you'll pass this class if you do these things let me show you how to write a good paper let me show you how to think through because what they're asking was i think it was on sherlock holmes or something they were asking me to think in a new way and they're like you can always do this and and um and that was really valuable to me um and i had a bunch of professors at that university um who always took me seriously you know, um, I was in a creative writing program and um, and I focused on poetry and there's not a lot of poets that are making money in the world. So I think professors just got it. They know the only way to make money as a poet is to teach and that's unlikely ever going to do that. And if you're in this program, you probably just really want to write poetry um, and, and write. And so that mindset was built in um, to a certain degree. Um, but that was a huge and, and it was a, a well-known um, department at that school I thought was really valuable. Secondly, to Boise State's credit, um, because we've not said a ton of nice things about them. And it, I was one reminded they're a young university recently, which is helpful. They are, they used to just be a community college and they've slowly grown. So they're working in certain directions. Um, and two, I went into a program where I had no similarly minded peers but I said, I want to do philosophy of education and I don't see that offered here. And they said, okay, that's great, but you're going to have to design it kind of thing. And so I did mm -hmm. independent study. I wrote a thesis that went against everything that they expect from a thesis typically. Um, and they made room for that. I didn't have a lot of support because the sort of faculty wasn't built in that direction, but they at least made it possible for me to do that and not just do another sociological study on how, why teachers are ineffective at starting their class in the first five minutes after the bell rings or something like that. You know, we've already done enough of those. I didn't want to do that. I think another thing that Boise State University, I think like the idea of it is a good idea is teaching or requiring this class called University Foundations 100. And lots of different departments um like take charge of teaching a section of that class and they get to apply it to a certain field so like the sociology department it is college worth it there were classes about alien life and thinking about the climate and more science oriented ones and that class you're required to read a little book called what is it becoming called? a learner becoming a learner which i mean if they're not going to read jaspers then that's probably the second best like thing that they could be reading and so I think adding that to the requirement it students they have to take it kind of first thing before they can continue moving on and pursuing their degree 
And it kind of just challenges them and makes them think, well, why am I here? What does it really mean to be a student and a learner? And so like the idea of that class, I think is important and letting students kind of pick an interesting field as they learn communication skills and um, critical thinking skills. Those who maybe didn't have that opportunity in high school was really valuable. Um, and being able to kind of develop a course like that and, and teach it was especially really valuable. I know Dave also got to teach some of the discussion sections of that course. And so I think Boise State like has that going for them for sure. Another, I guess, like my professor shout out, controversial, controversial, Scott Yenner was like the best professor I had at Boise State. People don't like him because he's a conservative, but that was one of the classes that I referenced earlier that he just assigned books and then we wrote essays. And then at the end of the class, we just, rather than a final paper, we had um, a 10 minute meeting with him and it was just a dialogue and he graded us based on, oh, did you critically think about this course and were you able to kind of remember and understand and analyze and comprehend the, my lectures and these hard texts, like some stuff we were reading, Alex de, de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, Aristotle's Politics. Um, well, he liked Russian literature. I read a lot of Russian literature. Um, but those were like outside of the research with the sociology department, like the most valuable classes I had because he gave me like a, not a, a grade that I was not expecting on my first paper because I was just used to, oh, I can write really well. I can write what the teacher wants me to write. And he would sit down, he'd read your paper, and then he'd audio record all of his comments, like in a notes app and just email it to you. And so he like gave you this really thorough feedback of, I think you needed to, you know, think about your thesis a little bit more. And why did you not consider this? And like that, just having like this dialogue with this professor, kind of throughout the university in forms of this like rich, meaningful feedback that you're just not used to getting from professors. Usually they, I mean, in my experience, they go, oh, have your peers read it. And when you, and then they grade the final thing and go, eh, good enough, 90%, 95% with no real rhyme or reason to it. And so they definitely have some professors at Boise State who like are doing that good work and really trying to have di dialogues with students about their work. Yeah, that is a controversial take for sure because he was being canceled uh, year after year after year for various things, usually his takes on women or something like that. But it's usually like something people read into his conservatism a lot because he's very professional in the classroom. Um, and yeah, least, yeah, exactly. I, like I never experienced any sort of like, oh, he's being hyperpolitical. Oh, he's saying something he shouldn't be saying. Oh, he thinks less of me because I'm a like a student, like at the end of class, he said, Miss Snowgrove, you, I know you and I have kind of differing political views, but I really appreciate your contribution to the class. And I wish you spoke up more. It was like, like, what more could you ask for is like, he was super professional outside of the, the classroom. He's a silly, silly man, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> but he's good at his job. And so, uh, we're about to get into the the questions that we have going forward. One of the things that I want everyone to think about and then write about in the forum, because folks, we have a forum at theory-underground.com forward slash forums. This course in particular, if you join it, then you get to be a part of a conversation, a conversation with us. And uh, we're going to be talking about the idea of the university, the text, but we're also going to be talking about um, some of these other issues. And so the, that'll be a place to put a topic and uh, get, get thoughtful responses. Uh, something I want all of you to think about is your final project. Every one of us should be doing a final project. Now, if you don't, that's on you. But because you're not, you're not getting graded. You, there's no credentials here. We're doing it for its own sake. But in terms of reading, writing, conversation the reading is one part the conversation is another but the intermediary is the writing and part of it is taking notes doing exegesis making sense of it for yourself what would be helpful for you weekly 
in terms of expectations. What would be helpful for you weekly? Yes, we want to have a final project, but what, what would be helpful for you week to week as we go? Brian, I know you have an idea um, for what you're going to take charge on. Would you like to share what you will be doing in the forum on a weekly basis? Uh, yeah, so it's pretty simple. Um, in our weekly conversations on Saturday, uh, I will have a set of discussion questions that I've prepared in advance that are going to structure, loosely structure, uh, our discussion on the reading for the week. We may or may not to get, get to all of the questions, um, and we may find some more interesting than others. Following the conversation, those will be posted in the forum. Um, with a call to respond. Um, basically calling on anybody who's involved to think back to our discussion. Was there anything we said that you were confused about, agreed with, most importantly, weren't sure about or disagreed with, um, and then reflect on those things. It will not, the expectation is not that everyone responds to all questions and you just jump through a bunch of hoops, uh, but more so that they are guided to springboard and help thinking. And if you go off of them, because you also recognize, hey, there was this thing I was thinking about the whole time I was reading, you guys didn't even talk about, that's also important too. Um, so they're a tool um, and not a requirement, but that will be something that's provided each week. <clears throat> Dave, I cannot hear a single thing you're saying. Thank, thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. One of the things that I think that would be good is that whatever we do week to week outside of responding to those questions would be something along the lines of, you know, pick a page to do an exegesis on. Like, pick a page to say, here's how this is really important to the chapter. So you kind of have to say what's going on in the chapter. Here's why this page is so important to the chapter and the larger purpose of the book and what I'm thinking about it, but mostly like unpacking it, right? And one of the wonderful things about this text is that there's no copyright on it. It's uh, in the public domain. So you can get the PDF, you can get the audiobook, whatever, but you can also just copy and paste the text. And I don't know, there's all, there's all sorts of ways of doing a line by line analysis, but you know, you can put the text of the page into a Word document and then change the color of it and then you have your own color of text and you sit there and you actually write out line by line analysis, like sentence by sentence, what's going on. There's a variety of ways of going about this. Yeah. I just want to add for those who are maybe new to that practice, I know that was really overwhelming for me as a practice and it's pretty laborious to do. Um, another really easy um, thing to do is if you still take that page, if you're like, I don't know how to do a line by line analysis, what does analysis mean, all of this stuff, take it and rewrite it in your own words. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's a great starting point and demands thinking, right? There it we demands go. that you think about what's on the page and, and put it in your own words. Excellent. And along with that, I think like a lot of students just might be used to like taking notes on a reading because it's relevant to the test. And so like trying to actively read, I mean, I love, I will write down the whole quotes that I just think, wow, like what a great point. Writing down questions and associations as you read is really important. It's maybe not like going to go directly into the forum, but for your own sake, like trying to engage with your own thoughts as you're reading and whether that looks like writing things down for you or highlighting and writing within the pages of your your book or having you know typing it out like whatever method or even I mean Dave like I'm gonna expose you here like Dave makes little doodles and makes these like artful notes like whatever method helps you get your what's going on in your brain out onto something concrete like as you're reading will be I think important and really will you know, it's, it's starting to get at what Jasper cares about and why he thinks the idea of the university is important is like learning and engaging. This is educational. That's what Anne is trying to say somehow. No, I'm, this is the one page that has doodling without notes. Normally there's a bunch of notes yeah. in there as well, but 
Yeah, learning to bullet point things has been really one of my favorite things as well. And then the last thing I'd say about final projects is, look, we're non-conventional, obviously, but if you want to write something that could be published in a magazine, in uh, uh, some journal somewhere, uh, if you want to write something that could be potentially selected for an anthology of writings that come out of theory underground in the future, um, if you want to write a standard sort of college essay, if you want to do a video essay, I know these are a lot of options, but there's only a few of us. And so basically, Nance, I just want you to think about it and then hit me up later uh, after you've slept on it. Hit me up with kind of what you're thinking or get into the forum and, and talk about it there. But um, whatever it is, we kind of want to make it work to your um, preferences or like what your <laughs> now here I am. What's your goals? What's your mission? But um, yeah, we, we want to because you the, the, the point is, is like you're writing and you're writing with the fact that it will be looked at by other people and you will get feedback on it. That potential recognition there really charges the field and makes it different. And so that brings your thinking into a kind of new relation when you're writing. So uh, lastly, the forum and the, and the questions. So folks on the on the side of, uh, on the YouTube side, if you're looking at the, the video, if you're listening to this on podcast, and I'm sorry, you won't be able to see it, but I will try to help for the visually impaired or uh, distracted. Keep your eyes on the road if you're driving. Basically, I'm going to pull up in front of us all here the, uh, the website. Everybody, what's the problems you've had with the website so far? Is there anything, any, not, if it's been solved, then it's been solved, but uh, a lot of people, when they register with the website to take a course, um, they've had the issue of not getting the verification email. Uh, you just have to have it resent, and then you'll usually get it after that point. Is there any other kind of issues you've, you've all run into so far? No? Cool. Um, so, I guess I'll say one thing that we kind of worked out last night is figuring out like where to post things, because when I initially made my introduction, I just posted it like in the feed, but then realized, oh, there's like the feed, which kind of like Facebook, it shows you what everyone's been doing and what they've been saying. But then there's like actual discussions. And so I imagine maybe like when Brian puts forth those discussion questions, it will be under the discussions tab. And then maybe we should plan on like replying directly under there, like for the right. introductions to the course, we directly replied to your like introduce yourself and not just creating like a new new section in the feed which is like my own confusion and dave uh just to clarify since you kind of programmed everything you can at people in the forum right can you i don't know i'm asking do you know like if so let's say we have like a long discussion going where there's like all of us have responded to something and i want to respond to something you said but it was like four posts ago can i at plead and then yes it, it tags you Yes. Okay. Yeah, that will be really helpful if we do that, make that kind of the practice. Just if you're speaking directly to somebody or in response to somebody, tag them in some way. All right. I just I just tagged you and I said, yo, does this work? So let me know if you get a notification for that. Hopefully you will. Um, but Anne's, Anne's, Anne's 100% correct. Not only is this a forum, there's also a sort of Facebook feel to the software. Um, I pay premium for that, that theme. Look, works. if you... If, if you've got eyes on, oh, perfect. If you've got eyes on the screen, folks, um, there is a feed, like Ann said. You can click on the feed, and then you'll just see everything that's been most recent in chronological order. You'll be able to scroll down. Um, but if you click on discussions, that's where you can start a new topic, and then the conversation kind of kind of unfold underneath your unique post. Um, introductions are just happening under here. So uh, Bryce, I know you've introduced yourself in one of the other forums. Maybe copy and paste that into this one as well and then expand on some of the things that you have in, uh, that you're thinking about after this conversation there. Um, but if we scroll down um, inside of the first topic post, uh, it's called Introductions for the Idea of University Cohort. Uh, Brian has a post here. Anne has a post here. I have a post here. And by the way, I just added a feature yesterday that makes it so that we can thumb we can thumbs up one another's posts. Yeah, it's just fun. But uh, each of us came up with questions. 
And so let's each just talk about a few of the questions that we have, and then we'll close out. Uh, let's just give it like five more minutes here, actually. We're going to kind of speed through. So what are a couple of the top questions that you're going to have going into this text? Mine is how do truth, science, and philosophy relate to one another? How ought they relate versus how do they tend to relate? That's one of my big questions going through this. Yeah, I think my questions um, go right along with the research that I did at the university. So one question is like, in what ways does the modern neoliberal university uphold the ideas presented by Asper's? And in what ways does the modern university fail to do so? And maybe, you know, thinking about what needs to change, what those differences are, as well as a question that I actually thought about as I was kind of rereading the text is looking at the difference between uh, facts versus ideas. Some of those like distinctions that he makes when he talks about two things that may be opposite or that maybe we think are kind of similar and just working through like all of the little things that we think we know what they are. We think we know what ideas and facts are or natural science versus humanities and all of that. Um, so that's kind of my focus while talking about this. And then um, the questions I have. So we have been in this conversation uh, very casually throwing around the term truth and Jaspers does the same. Um, so I think it's important for us to clarify what he means by that. Um, he did write a whole lecture in this book called Truth where he does a better job at defining it. So I'll bring that in, but we do wanna clearly understand what he means by truth. Um, or the different kind of truths that there might be. Um, what's the difference between uh, the idea of the university and maybe the idea of school? How are they different? How does Jasper's, um, I mean, he's pretty clear they're different, but he's not clear in what way. Um, and why does the university have to be a state supported institution? Mm. Uh, it seems to suggest that the idea of the university is connected to the state in some way, almost as an institution even though the birth of the university was before the birth of the modern state. So that will be, I think, one of our most interesting conversations. Yeah, and on that note, one of my questions, I say, because the idea is one we can be true to, even if not working within the university as an institution. So there you go, Nance. You don't have to get a degree to have fidelity to the idea. And so a bunch of your relatives might have got their degrees, but they might not have fidelity to the idea. So that's one of the things that you get out of this course is the ability to say, well, I've flushed out the notion of what that actually is, and I have daily lifelong fidelity to it as an idea, even though I'm not within the institution or I don't have its credentials, right? And that's one of the things that Jaspers acknowledges is that people can work outside of the university, right? So... I say, uh, then what are some of the problems posed on those of us who are working outside of the university? For people like me or Cadell Last, who's also going to be participating in this, by the way, and he's a little bit of a celebrity when it comes to underground philosophy and theory. He's got his own institution, his own pseudo sort of like self-driven you know, institution thing. Like they, they get together, they talk about philosophy, like they've had real life meetings, but it's a lot of online stuff that kind of comes out of his channel. He's going to be a part of these conversations. That's really exciting. I'm so glad that he's going to be participating. The reason he's so interested in this is the same reasons that we all are, but specifically he and I, both as people who have our own websites with courses on them, the question is, uh, what are we doing? We're not exact. We're not univer We're not a university. We're not state funded. We don't have credentials. Um, and in a sort of sense, Jaspers would say, then there's problems. There are inherent problems to our position. Um, and so we want to take seriously his critique of us and see what he, what, what, what would he, what, what are we supposed to do? You know, we're in a double bind. And the, the, the solution to a double bind is not to wave your hands and run away. And it's not just to take one side. It's to tarry with the negative and work through the contradiction. Okay. 
Yeah, so for those of us organizing courses, what are some of the concerns that Jaspers would likely raise? I want to get into the contradictions of pursuing the idea of the university outside of the institution since the institution is so important to Jaspers. Yeah, and so I've got a bunch of other questions, and I hope that everyone will get a chance to look over one another's questions in the forum and uh, that people joining this week to take this course with us or in the future will also get a chance to look over those and come up with their own questions as well. All right. Anything else anyone would like to say before we close this thing out? Just happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really stoked to be doing this with you all. Yeah, this text is awesome. And anyone who cares about the idea of the university will hopefully get really excited about this. Or even if you don't care about the idea of the university, if the weird notion of pursuing truth for its own sake rings a little bell on the inside that you can't quite under, understand what that is, it, this touches on that too. Yeah, that for sure. Cool. All right, everybody. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining. Looking forward to talking to you on Saturday. Cool. And I'll see you in the forum. Bye-bye. Y'all then. Bye. Bye. I'm going to keep streaming here really quick just to give a quick rundown for some people. It's a note from our sponsors. And uh, really quick, hold on while I get the camera back on. Here we go. So who is our sponsors? Our sponsors is me. Okay. I'm the sponsors. So what I want to show everybody really quick is the website. I've put uh, all of my time and energy into this thing. And I mean, not just in the last month and a half, but I mean, uh, my entire educational journey and all of my various experiments that I've been doing over the years have culminated in this instantiation. All right. And so what I really wanted to do, what I want to do really quick before closing out is just show you all that the website's up that there is a public forum. You don't have to be in one of the courses to enter the public forum. The public forum is right here. If you go to theory-underground.com forward slash forums forward slash main, it's this one right here, then you'll be able to uh, join the public conversation. All right, so register with the website, get in there, and you'll be able to start a discussion. This doesn't have a lot going in it yet because it only started a week ago, okay? And then lastly, if you go up to theory-underground.com forward slash support, it's a kind of secret URL. You have to type it in. There's no button for it. If you go to support, you'll see the backside of the store, okay? And I say backside just because it's not, it's, not, it's not integrated into the website too well just yet. But this is where you can add things to the cart, including courses and patron packages. And right now there are two. One is for a $50 patron tier. That's this one right here. And then the other one is paying for one-tenth of the annual cost of Theory Underground means of production, which is currently $158.70. It will be a lot more in the future because costs are only projected to go up. And so if you have money and you don't have the time or energy to participate in this, but you believe in this project and you don't want to see it die from lack of attention or money, then please add that to your cart and start today at least making payments as a patron because it really does mean the world. And at the moment, this is my main job and it doesn't pay. It does not pay. So uh, you can maybe help with that. So we're going to close out by playing Bert's testimonial and uh, that'll be that. Then we'll close out the stream. Bert Vanderkar is someone that I met through doing the stuff that Brian kind of was referring to, right? Uh, Brian and I have been leading discussion groups and talking about philosophy for a long time. And Bert is just a beautiful soul and one of those people who just cares about thinking in all three ways, which is reading, writing, and conversation. And so uh, we wanted to interview him because he is not... Um, he doesn't look like how you'd expect if you ex if you expect that all of the people that are involved with the stuff that we do are like teenagers or something like that, right? No, we've got a lot of diversity when it comes to age, and uh, I, we have a lot to learn from Bert, and so uh, we really wanted to highlight his testimonial here 
So I'll push play, mute myself, and let's go. I couldn't believe it when I saw that poster. Bold real art in Boise fucking Idaho? Are you kidding me? It was virtually an, an answer to an unspoken prayer, you know, it really was. And I just couldn't believe that somebody was interested in the things that I was interested in, that I had been interested in for years and had kind of given up on in, in futility. I'd labored in solitude for so long. I had no one to talk to about it, no one to bounce ideas off of. It, it just vastly accelerated my ability, to, I don't get too philosophical, to interrogate to inquire and to see connections between things. And so the theory underground that Dave is developing in this mission is, is trying to reach an audience of people who aren't just doing philosophy in a university setting. Why is there an advantage to doing philosophy outside of an academic right. setting? Well, the neat thing is that you can really drill down. You know, when you're in school, you know, you don't you have to do 50 things, and you do them all partially. And uh, it's like you're digging a well. And you're digging very shallow wells. When you can drill down deep and take your time and really get into something, especially with a company of fellows, that you get into the slipstream of, of a great philosopher, and you just have to take the deep dive. Uh, but initially, a lot of these philosophers, they're speaking to a tradition, they're trying to resolve specific problems, and they just assume you know what those are, that you've had their life experience. So the first time you read read them, you're, you're just trying to get the lay of the land. And you may well uh, have some uh, insights, you may wrongly associate certain things you know with what they're saying. But um, then you'll maybe like look at a secondary text, and now, oh, since you have something to bring to the table, all the lights start going off. And then when you read the philosopher the second time, you can read them more knowledgeably. And so you're really, you're looking for things, you're better able to follow along, uh, you're not left behind so much. Uh, the third reading, though, and it's, these are for profound books. I mean, you don't have to read everything like this. But for a, a profound text, a third reading is where you've learned enough that you relate it to everything else you know, that you begin to see the connectedness between what this philosopher is doing and the, uh, the implicit, unstated um, situation that they were speaking to initially, you know something about that. And you see the connection between that and all sorts of other things. And you connect it to your life and the way you live and move through the world and the, the way you see things and interact with people. And you you are not just absorbing, you're creating. You're a co-creator. When it's all said and done, you just have to put it into your own words. And there's a danger of reductionism there. But when you put it into your own words and you're bringing all these different strands together, it's really phenomenal. And that's what the third reading does. So a few years ago, Dave running you know, the Three channel had a Patreon going and right. discontinued accepting money from people. But since then, you have continued to make a donation monthly. And it's, right. It's obviously very meaningful to Dave, meaningful to me as well, being Dave's partner. Right. And so why? Why, why do you do that? <laughs> essentially well Dave brings people together whatever Dave is doing is valuable and uh, my life was completely changed and I'm grateful I can't afford to give Dave 50 bucks a month but I do because it brings me joy every every time I get my social security the first thing I do is send fifty dollars to Dave and uh, my heart sings, and it's a sense of gratitude. I don't feel obligated to do it. I want to do it, 
And I want to do whatever I can to help Dave do for other people what he did for me. And I want uh, that to continue. And it's uh, truly, I take great joy in it. It's the best $50 I spend a month. It really is. If you can plant a seed where uh, a handful of people meet each other and they can all have the experience that we've had, um, face to face with each other, that would be awesome. Okay, everybody, now you know. Now you know. Go to theory underground.com forward slash support. And uh, Shapiro's dead cat in the chat saying, uh, Yeah, I can't afford 50 for sure. Yeah, um, I w I'm definitely going to add some lower tiers soon. I kind of, my big thing is I want people to know this is not primarily small patron driven um, because it's not just another Patreon, right? Like the, this is something else. I'm, I'm trying to, like, I don't want to take your money, especially if you only have five bucks and, you know, to give. Um, I do want to make it so that people can give it, but I don't want that to be the main point. The main point is to purchase courses. The main point will be to purchase merchandise of various kinds, but I want to have a bit of a, more of like a product base. Like you can actually get things because yeah, in a sort of sense, it's commodities, right? But in a more important sense, objects in our life world that are a little bit more permanent, um, than a tweet, right? Like actual physical objects in our world make a difference and taking you know and signing up for an actual activity where, where you are where you have assignments and, and and you join a larger discourse and you actually do a reading it's 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 less of a oh my lifestyle consumer habit is I subscribe to X Y and Z you know channels or patrons or whatever no no yeah there's always gonna be a piece of that but also we're doing things. We're here to do stuff. And so everybody who's here to do stuff, much love. Appreciate it so much. Thank you for being here. Take care. Hope you all have a wonder wonderful rest of your day, afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. Take care. Bye-bye.